The Craig Patton House is a splendid example of Greek Revival architecture in the Kanawha River Valley of West Virginia. Constructed in 1834, the Craig Patton House, or M. Grove as it was known then, was built in downtown Charleston, Virginia, now West Virginia, by James Craig, grandson of Dr. James Craig, who was a close friend and personal physician to George Washington. Later, the home was purchased by George and Susan Patton, grandparents of World War II General George S. Patton. It was saved by the National Society of Colonial Dams of America in the states of West Virginia and moved to its current location in 1973. On this episode, we're going to get a tour with Nathan Jones. So sit back, hit that subscribe button, let me know your favorite part in the comments, and let's get started. When this home was built, it was the first timber-framed home in town. Up until that point in time, all of the houses in this area were either log and there were a few brick. So this was a kind of a new style of building. And um, it's one of the earliest Greek revivals west of the Allegheny Mountains. Above the fireplace is a portrait of James Craig. And this would have been painted around 1836, giving us an idea of what he would have looked like while living in this home. Now, since we suspect that it was painted in 36, you'd still be an attorney here in this area. And recently, we've been going through records trying to figure out more about these court cases that he was involved in, and we're finding out a lot of interesting information. Uh, probably what he's most famous for is presenting petition, petitions to the Virginia Assembly trying to get lower toll rates for some of the salt manufacturers trying to ship their salt along the Canal River out to the western markets along in Ohio. He had a pretty interesting childhood uh, growing up in Valcluse. And because he lost his father, he and his mother would end up moving into the Valcluse mansion with his uh, grandfather, Dr. Craig. Since we've switched rooms, we've decided to make this the study. We could call it a library if we had some bookshelves, but we don't have those yet. We just have the books here in the Washington writing desk. This is a reproduction piece. After George Washington's death, he willed the original desk to his good friend, Dr. James Craig, who would eventually will it to his grandson in 1814. The original desk would make its way to Charleston and then eventually Louisville, and would stay in Louisville until 1906 when the crates would donate it back to Mount Vernon. Since the original is in Mount Vernon, we have a good reproduction here. Now I mentioned some of the books inside. Um, the Reverend Craig's granddaughter-in-law, Susan, would end up donating a few of his books to the museum. And we recently had one uh, restored, and that would be the book here. It has a new spine, had to fix some of the pages, but it, it's really neat to look through. It has some of Craig's own notes inside, oh, inside yeah. of some of the pages. He, it includes an 1859 speech he had given to the Kentucky State Legislature. Oh, and this was just two weeks after they hanged John Brown. A lot of the southern slaveholding states were already starting to talk about secession and playing the role of a peacemaker. James Craig went before them to, as he more or less put it, talk about the fundamental principles of the Union. Yeah. and the Constitution and why it was so important for them to remain united. Um, so of course, James Craig was playing the role of a peacemaker. And at that time, the man living in this home, George Patton, was probably packing his bags because the governor called it military convention in Richmond. So uh, and that convention was to be held in January of 1860. Um, a lot of events going on and James Craig playing the role of peacemaker, George Patton preparing for war, two, two sides of the coin there. <laughs> Now this is our parlor. These rooms are oftentimes referred to as main halls. We have sofas that had belonged to the Craig family, and when they were donated, the family said that they were built around 1806, and we don't necessarily have anything verifying that. Could be a bit of confusion because that's the year that the Reverend Craig was born. 
but if they are from that period, we might assume that they could have been in this home, but we just don't have any documentary evidence like saying that they were. I just, yeah. I'd love to believe that they were. <laughs> There's James Craig in his liturgical garments. He'd become a pretty influential Episcopal minister. After the Civil War, he was most renowned or well-known for having reunited the um, Episcopal Church. Like many churches, they would side north or south, um, but he was able to bring them back together. Uh, he would end up preaching at St. or Christ Church Episcopal in Louisville up until his death in 1882. This is the original fireplace in the home, but it's not the original marble. We've learned that the marble would not have been as white, it would have been more black, but we just haven't gotten around to fixing that yet. <laughs> it's kind of hard to just find some new marble. The eagle and the star? Yeah, we do have some electricity in here, but that would have been <laughs> the way that they kept the house lit. We also have some gas lamps, which, you know, you don't really think about. But here in the Kanawha Valley, um, especially in the mid-1800s, folks were pulling coal out of the mountains and converting it into oil, which is a very expensive project. And as a matter of fact, George Patton, when he wasn't doing his work as an attorney or drilling with a militia unit called the Kanawha Rifleman, he was serving on the board of directors of the Coal River Navigation Company. They were pulling a specific type of coal out of the mountains called cannel coal, which was then converted into that gas, cannel coal oil. Hmm. Um, really, that industry was only a successful venture during the 1850s because in around 1858, 1859, folks are finding out that they can develop the natural gas in the fields of Pen in, in Pennsylvania. So we see that really taking hold. Oh, and, the, and then there was an event that kind of disrupted everything called the Civil War. <laughs> but really, cannel coal oil just wasn't as prof profitable as natural gas. So this front bedroom is still depicted in that 1834 to 1844 period. So it looks like a room that James and Juliet would have used. By the way, Juliet was his wife. She was from Charleston. She was born not far from here, just, uh, I would say, about eight miles east. But her family was involved in the salt business, and it was that salt business that put Charleston on the map. Our four-poster trundle bed was donated by the historic Glenwood Estate. It's an old home over there on the Charleston West Side. It was built in the late 1850s. It was owned by a congressman named George Summers. And he was a chief judicial, uh, chief judicial, chief district judge. <laughs> uh, George Summers, while um, having lived in this area and made quite a name for himself, was born in Alexandria, Virginia, and just four years older than Craig. They knew each other there and remained friends here in this area. So it's a cool connection. But it's not the only connection that we have to this house because George Summers and George Patton would end up becoming law partners around 1859. That and a few other items from Glenwood really helps pull that uh, part of the interpretation together. This is our nursery. It took me a minute, but I finally mentioned James Craig's wife, Juliet, but they also had seven kids living with them in this home. They would eventually have 11 total, so quite a large family. Along with James, Juliet, and their seven kids, here at this home, based on county tax records, we know that there would have been, on average, approximately three enslaved women working and living in, on this property. James Craig inherited a number of enslaved people after the death of both his father and his uncle. And in 1814, with the death of his grandfather, he would end up inheriting even more enslaved people. According to the 1830 census, we know that he had approximately 19 enslaved people ranging in age from 1 to 65 on his Mason County property. And um, unfortunately, we don't know the names of these enslaved people, but after some research into wills and different inventories, um, unfortunately, unfortunately, these folks were listed uh, in inventories as property, we're starting to uncover names and we're hoping to be able to link that with some age records and 
determine whether or not we can figure out mm -hmm. who these people were yeah. um, to add to the story. So this is our patent room. Uh, so we're, we're, we're stepping ahead in time. You're going to see fancy, newfound technology like this antique sewing machine here. So Wilcox and Gibbs model that likely dates to 1875 to 1885. Uh, we believe that Susan Patton would have been one of the first women in town to own a sewing machine. And we, sus we suspect that's the case because in 1862, during the Civil War, she would write a letter to George. In the fall of 1862, Confederate forces had occupied the city of Charleston for three weeks, and she asked him, hey, please sell the house and all of my belongings. The only thing I want to keep is my sewing machine, the family Bible, and the law books. Uh, George was unable to sell the home because Union forces were able to pull themselves together and come back up the Kanawha River and reoccupy the city of Charleston. Uh, it wouldn't be until the fall of 1863 that Patton and a large contingent of Confederate forces were forced into the Shenandoah Valley. I'm sure that the statehood founders who were trying to form the state of West Virginia in what was then the capital of Wheeling were pretty uh, happy that they no longer had to worry about these men who were trying to hang them uh, for what they considered treason. Uh, now, it wouldn't uh, Pat would participate in a number of battles, and I try not to get too far into the weeds unless folks want to know more about a Civil War career. Um, I will mention, though, that in, in the fall of 1864, he would become mortally wounded at the Third Battle of Winchester. He wouldn't allow Union surgeons to amputate his leg, and it would end up getting infected, and it ultimately killed him. His wife, who was living with his brother in um, Albemarle County, would remain there for a while until the Civil War had ended. She would sell this home and use part of the money to purchase steamship tickets that would take her from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast. The photograph that we have on the dresser there was taken in 1866 in Los Angeles, and it shows Susan and her th three children, while she actually had four, a five-year-old named Andrew was, uh, I, I, I'm assuming, unable to sit still long enough to have his photo taken. <laughs> uh, but Susan would have that photograph taken and mailed back to Charleston. It would eventually fall into the hands of this man's wife. Um, this man's name was Thomas Brune. He was Patton's friend and his first law partner here in the area. Thomas is pictured with a number of other men. This photograph was taken in the summer of 1865. These are uh, Confederate veterans who came together to have their photograph taken after the war had ended. Um, many of these men were restricted from holding public office. They were um, unable to go into business again. And it wasn't until 1871, and that's, that's early compared to like the 1876 end of Reconstruction, but it wouldn't be until 1871 when there's a big change in the new state government. It changes hand from the Republican-dominated legislature to, a Democrat, the, to the Democrat Party, and they grant general amnesty to a lot of these former Confederate soldiers, allowing them the right to vote. Um, and what happens is we see things going back to the, the way they were before the war. Now, this is an interesting man here, Captain Swan. He would end up participating in that third battle of Winchester, the one that Pat was mortally wounded at. He was captured and would spend the remainder of the war at Fort Delaware, and in 1888 would write a bitter memoir about his time imprisoned there. And uh, if you're reading the memoir, you think, why are you complaining? Like, it sounds like you didn't have it that bad. <laughs> there were much worse uh, prisons uh, in uh, Andersonville or Elmira, but uh, it seems like his uh, art class, Sunday school services that they were able to participate in was a lot better. Maybe it was because he was an officer, I'm not that sure. <laughs> um, after Susan sold the home, she would end up selling it to a guy named Dr. Hogue. And the Hogue family would own this property up until around the late 1920s. After the late 1920s of 
private brokerage company bought the house. They'd convert the wings into apartments. This parlor was converted into a dance studio. And I can only imagine how annoying it would be to be living in an apartment while folks are learning how to ballroom dance. <laughs> it just had to have been the noisiest thing in the world. Well, so the, Cra the Cricks would have 11 kids total, but only seven when they were living here. When they would make that 500 mile journey on horseback, poor Juliet was eight months pregnant for their eighth child, so they almost had eight kids here. And somehow, miraculously, both mother and child was, was fine after the birth. I'm like, gosh, can you, can you imagine how uncomfortable that would be? So when it came to like rebuilding this house here, are all the floors new or like are they? These are the original floors that they were able to find underneath of plywood. Yeah. Now the floors were a little different in our nursery or children's room and that's because that area was the only spot of the house where the floors could not be uh, preserved. Right. So I mentioned that a lot of the things would, are donated from families that have lived here. This pure table is not one of those items. This is an item that we had to purchase at auction. Pure tables. Are, and it's spelled P-I-E-R. Pier is the name of the wall that's be between two portals, either doors or windows. So this is a specific piece of furniture that's made exactly for this type of wall. What's cool about this piece is that it's attributed to a Philadelphia cabinet maker named Antoine Gabriel Crevel. He had immigrated from France and became, became pretty popular for these nice pieces of furniture that he was making. He was so well recognized that by the mid-1830s, he was commissioned by President Andrew Jackson to design furniture for the White House. So we got one of his earlier wow. pieces. And if you look at his, if you look at Curvell's uh, White House furniture, it's a lot more fancy. Yeah. There's a lot of gold gilt. I'm sure. Hers is a little more <laughs> subdued. Yeah. Well, that's the end of the tour of the Craig Patton House. Make sure to hit that subscribe button because I have one more episode to do in West Virginia. And it's one you don't want to miss. So hit that subscribe button, leave me a comment of your favorite part of this episode, and we'll see you in the next one.